Hello, I'm Victoria Blunt. Welcome back to The Green Room. I created this space to connect with fellow creatives during lockdown and find out all about their route through the industry and how they navigated difficult times. Okay, one second. Um, uh, see, my lighting's a bit weird here. Yeah? Uh, find your light, find your light, darling. <laughs> My guest today is national treasure, Joseph Marcel. His career has been legendary, spanning almost 50 years in TV, film and theatre in the UK and across the globe. He achieved cult status with his role of Geoffrey the Butler in The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, but continues to surprise his fans with a variety of roles and characters. I got to work with Joseph very briefly a few years ago and his willingness to share his experience and offer advice to budding performers really demonstrates his generosity of character. I hope you enjoy this chat. How how have you been? I've been very well. So well actually I, I you know it's been it's been kind of strange. I was um filming uh this thing in uh October and no well November December and I I tore some ligaments in my ankles, so um, I've had a pretty uh, painful Christmas. But uh, it's uh, it's almost healed now, so so both ankles are back together again. Thank God. Oh God, what were you doing? How did you manage to do that? Well, I, I, I had to wear some Wellingtons, and when we did the costume fitting, everything seemed all right. But when we were on set, I mean, they happened to be they kept feeling too small, and uh, and then the next morning. Um, at my uh, Airbnb, I mean, I just couldn't get out of bed because my ankles were swollen. So um, uh, this week has been the first week since uh, the 18th of December, which, which is when we wrapped, that I actually kind of, uh, I'm not in pain. Recovering from the killer wellies. Yes, the killer wellies. <laughs> too. I remember you telling me you were born in St. Lucia and then you moved to Peckham. My parents moved to uh, moved to Bermondsey in London. Yeah, yeah. The, the only difference is that it was that I'd never seen trees, um, denuded trees, trees without leaves on them. You know, I'd never seen that before. So you know, we come from a very green and verdant island. So to see trees that were brown without trees, without yeah. leaves, is pretty pretty strange. Yeah. The Caribbean to southeast London does sound yeah. like a bit of a change. Well, yeah. I, I I mean I think I think and you know and also in those days you know um, you had to do what you had to do to survive really yeah you were training I believe tell me if I'm wrong you were training to be an electrical engineer yeah an electrical engineer I uh, and I happened to see the um, the Negro Ensemble as they had as they've become they were at that time the American Negro Theater they were they were performing. An entertainment, I suppose you could describe it as. It had song, dance, theatre called A Black New World. And um, they were part of the world theatre season. And uh, my friends and I um, accidentally went to see it. And that was it, really. I thought, my God, this is amazing. How do you go about making that turnaround then? Were your family supportive of that? That was the question. How do you go about um, moving from one thing to another, I, I had no clue. I, I mean, I I continued uh, um, my studies and uh, I got my uh, higher national diploma. And uh, I just thought, well, perhaps um, I don't want to do a degree. I so I'll see how one becomes an actor. And uh, um, I discovered that most actors lived in West Hampstead, so I I moved to West Hampstead and. Uh, um, I, I I I joined a small uh, theatre company, um, theatre training uh, company called Hampstead Studios, and that's where I studied for four years. Yeah, my mentor at that time was a lady called Nina Finberg, who um, who ran that school, and you know, and she's the one that guided my my professional life to towards you know becoming an actor and taking care of it and were you working at the same time as that were you of course yes so i had to i had to pay for my bed set I, I i was lucky enough that i you know i could bluff the electrical thing you know would you always fall back on that in quieter moments well yes um it, it was it was really helpful um i, I made friends with with a, with a couple of uh, uh companies and electrical companies and so they they kind of accepted that 
that perhaps you know actors spend a long time out of work and and they're gone for a short while and that you know I could always return and that that helped me through through um, part of the part of the uh, 70s up to I would say the 80s do you have any horror audition stories from that time oh my god horror aud- oh yes oh my god it was 1968 i had just started doing this this drama school thing and a friend of mine was playing i forgot the name of the character in hair and jonathan decided he'd get me an audition for hair i said I can't sing. He said, no, 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 you'll be great. You'll be great. You'll be, you'll be, you'll be fine. You, you, I mean, you can, you'll, you'll be great. You'll be, you'll be perfect. And the first song I had to sing was Yesterday. <laughs> it's yesterday. All my troubles. And the piano is going that way. And I'm <laughs> <laughs> the, the piano is in Holborn. And I'm still at the Seven Dials. You know? <laughs> Embarrassing. Terrible. I, I kind of started my, my working life as an actor in, uh, in 1970. I did a, a children's theatre show and uh, then I was unemployed, so I worked as an electrician. Then I went to join the, the, the uh, Vanguard Theatre at the Sheffield Playhouse, as it was in those days. Mm. And I was there for a year um which was a which am- which was amazing we did uh we we had to devise produce and present um uh, uh shows for 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 16 year olds and then our evening work was we we had to do modern plays like um i don't know plays like the technicians by alwyn weimark and stuff in the evening because we were given our own theater and our own premises so yeah it was pretty hard work and um, so I was there for a year my agent sent me for an audition for the Royal Shakespeare Company um, and I joined the Royal Shakespeare Company in, in January January the 8th 1972. And so leading up to that then Joseph it was a uh, that year in Sheffield was was that one of the first times you'd had just solid employment for that year as an actor? Uh, yes, I, I have to say I was lucky in that um, my my challenges with the Sheffield Vanguard um, were, were were just amazing. I mean, I I, I played things like Mephistopheles in Doctor Faustus, um, Claudius in Hamlet, stuff like that. Yeah, I did. You know, I did uh, uh, extraordinary roles that I would not have done. You know, even if I were part of a rep. You know, and yeah, so I I, I really did learn how to do my job. As it were. Yeah. So jumping back to the RSC. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of actors can think of the RSC as being a sort of impenetrable fortress to try and get into. And <laughs> being a, a young black actor in the 70s, I imagine that must have felt even more so. It, it really was a, an extraordinary achievement uh, um, because at that time, uh, the, only, the only really... Um, well, the the only leading black actor at that time were people like Oscar James at the RSC. That is, um, there was uh, an actor called Alton Kamalo. It was quite quite an achievement, yeah. And oh. I was what twenty two. I don't know. Oh my gosh, you were so young. Yeah. Um, wow. And when did you? So you were with? It was with Trevor Nunn, wasn't it? It was Trevor Nunn's first. First, uh, first season um, as the artistic director of the Royal Shakespeare Company. Yeah, gosh, that's incredible. And when did you? Was that a moment when you felt, as an actor, like I've made it? Uh, <laughs> well, 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 you do. I mean, you sort of think, you know, I'm a member of the Royal Shakespeare Company. You know, I, yeah, I, 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 I've arrived. You know, yeah, you, you, you do, um, and you do. And of course, um, that 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 initial excitement is 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 great, and but gradually it wears off because you actually need to work. You have, you know, you actually have to work and and use the facilities. You know, at that time we had um, uh, Cicely Berry uh, uh, was was voice, and uh, of course 
the late John Barton himself for text and stuff like that. Um, there were, you know, there, there were there was everything an actor needed. Um, um, I learned to fence. I learned, you know, I learned about text. I, le I learned about, you know, the history of, of, of Shakespearean plays, the difference between a Shakespearean play and the actual history of the time and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, great right. fun. Massively informative. John Barton, for anyone who's not watched those DVDs of, of him training up actors, it's, it's astonishing, his text work on Shakespeare and how much more accessible it feels the way he talks about it. Well, yes, and 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 for us, um, the young actors at that time, you know, um, there were people like Patrick Stewart, uh, John Wood, and there were, you know, extraordinary uh, um, actors of of the time. You know, they they were the you know they were the, the who's who of of Shakespearean who, actors. I, 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 my first stint with the RSE lasted um, for four five years. Um, we from then we came to London. And then from London, um, we were in a show called uh, Sherlock Holmes, which we took to Broadway for four months. Wow. Um, uh, and I decided that after that, that was 1975, I decided that one can't go to America and not go to California. So I went off to California. Uh, I had to go to Sausalito to see where the hippies hang out. And uh, I met, that's how I met my first wife. And uh, yeah, and I came back, came back to England. I joined Payne's Plough Theatre Company and I stayed with them. We stayed, we, that company, we were the original company. We stayed together for about two years. After that, my television career started. I, I, I was invited to, to be in something called Empire Road, which was the first um, written, black written, acted, mostly directed by, you know, non-white um, artists. So I did two seasons of that for the BBC in Birmingham, yeah. Because it was the first of its 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 kind ever, it it had it had it had more social significance than perhaps you know what we have now. You know? So did that garner like quite a large following? Were you getting recognised for that? Oh, absolutely! No, that, that was that was fun. I mean, that was that was that was extraordinary fun. And so by that point, is your day job completely gone? Are you just getting your income from acting? Absolutely. And what yeah. age are you around then? Do you mind me asking? I'm 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 in my thirties. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are there moments at that point of of sort of quieter times and near misses? <laughs> of course. <laughs> there were. I mean, I have to say that uh, the the, the theatre thing um, just happened and continues to happen. Touch wood. That I think there was a film. Oh my God, I can't remember what it was called in Guyana or something. Um, and, uh, and I went to the audition and I had my beard. It wasn't gray at that time. And, um, and, and then they, they wanted to see me again because they were, you know, they wanted to, to, to check costumes and stuff. And by then I had shaved my beard. And of course, and that was it. You know, you shave. Oh my God, you shave your beard. How long will it take you to grow? I said, well, it takes you about a month. Oh no, we don't have a month. We start next week. Oh my God, what we got? And so that that bit the dust. It's it's one of those things. Yeah, you know, you yes. sort of put it down to experience. How would you say you've managed to remain resilient? And how have you looked after your positivity and your mental health in those times which have been really hard? I found that you have to remember, always remember that first moment of excitement when you decided this is what you want to do. You know, th that kind of excitement, you must never lose that. You must never lose that optimism that at any moment the game can change. The case can be altered at any moment. The game changes. And that's what gets you through it. Because the dream is always there. And you must pursue that dream. Now, it is, it, it is not necessarily as easy as I make it sound. But that's really what it is. That, and that is what has kept me going. And, you know, uh, the bread jobs and the stuff that keep body and soul together, we all have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, do not give up your dream. So then after Empire Road, is that when you first auditioned for the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? No, 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 no. No, that, that, that would be too easy. 
that's that's years and years later. That's that's yeah. kind of years. Um, I I you know when when I when I finished with Payne's Plow, uh, I, I went to join a company in Lenox, Massachusetts called Shakespeare and Company. So I did a couple of seasons with them. Um, then then I came back. I went back to the Royal Shakespeare Company and. Uh, and I had the, you know, the, the dubious honor of the, being the first non-white actor to play Puck. Um, and of course, various other things. So I did that. And then I, I went back to America. Um, I worked with the Folger Theatre Shakespeare Company for a while. Then I came back. And, um, and we were doing the production, the first production uh, of a play called Joe Turner's Come and Gone. And while we were doing that, while we were presenting that in 1990, um, my agent said, we've had a call from these Americans and they wanted to put this on tape and uh, send it to them. It was a self-tape. You did a self-tape. Yeah. So I, I did a self-tape. Wait, you did a self-tape in the night. Was it an actual VHS? Yeah, it was, it was a VHS that was kind of about that huge. <laughs> Enormous. We sent it and they saw it and they said... Um, Okay, we like it. Can he be here on uh, tomorrow? My agent said, "Well, well, no. I'm sorry, you can't. Um, you have to. You'll have to wait until he's finished the run. But he finishes in a week's time. So, and as luck would have it, they said yes, and so we did it. And I finished on Saturday night. I got on a plane to um, uh, Los Angeles." They took me into this room. I met all these people. Um, I met Quincy Jones. Um, I met Will Smith. And I met all these other people. And Quincy Jones said to me, mm, 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 mm. I saw you in Measure for Measure, he said. I went, oh, how could, did you come to England to see? He said, no, you toured it with the Royal Shakespeare Company and you came to UCLA. He'd seen uh, you two years ago and that was, yeah. that's what had led you to, to this moment. Um, uh, th that's what I learned later. But at that time, you know, he just said, and it was like, fine. And, and you know, I was, you know, I, I was, that made me even more nervous, of course. <laughs> so we, we, we did it. Uh, we, we talked uh, and I had to sign some papers just in case I got the job. And so I signed it, which was a, a six-year commitment. And I signed it. And then we, they said, um, do, that, do that scene with Will. Do that scene with Will. So, so, so we did the scene and they fell about. And, oh. and, and, then, and then Will did something else and I, and I answered him. Then he did, and I said, isn't that how he's going to do it? And that, and that moment was the most important moment because... Um, with all Jeffrey's stiffness and me stepping out and saying to Will Smith, no less, is that how he's going to do it? <laughs> that was the thing that really got it. So I, they, they got, they, we did that and they said, um, go and have a cup of coffee. Um, we will meet the network in a few minutes. So I, I stepped downstairs outside to have a cigarette. And while I'm standing outside having a cigarette, I realized I didn't have a light. So there was this huge, huge black man standing there smoking. So I said, uh, do you have a light? And he said, I've got an accent. <laughs> I said, well, I think you've got the accent, right? Oh, you're a Brit. I said, well, I think so, yeah. He said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm here to see Will Smith and all that stuff. Oh, he said, oh, you're here for that stuff. So what, what, where do you live? Do you live in, you know, do you live in, 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 in um, Sherman Oaks or Burbank? Or no, I said, I just flew in from London last night. They flew you in from London? <laughs> oh, shit. Well, man, don't worry. You got the job. Here, have a light. Anyway, so we did that and I smoked it and we smoked. And so I said, what, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm going up for the role of Jeffrey, I think. You know, the butler. I said, I said oh, that's me too. Oh, he said, oh, well, I'm, I don't have a chance, man. I'm <laughs> I don't have a chance. You got it. So, so. <laughs> and of course, Joseph is speaking about James Avery, who later became the much beloved Uncle Phil in The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. We smoke and we talk, and of course, he was he was into classical theatre. So all of a sudden, 
you know, it was kindred spirits. We had this rapport and we we remained friends until his very last moment, you know, because it, it was I that took him to the hospital in his last moments. So I go off and, and I do my thing and they take me to the to meet the network and I'm in this room and Will has, re, has relaxed because I'm not, you know, I'm not the character that I play and, and you know, yeah. we, have, we have fun. And Will said, um, are you, you know, you ready? Can we do? I said, you just do what you like. And of course, we did all this physical comedy while we were doing this audition. And unbeknownst to me, outside in the corridor were all the actors who were auditioning. No. For you Jeffrey know? as well. Jeffrey, for Philip. For Ashley, for Hillary, for you know, for everyone, everybody's sitting outside listening to these people laughing with at Will and this man from London. Yeah, I've I've been waiting outside a room, about to go in, and heard someone reading the part I'm going for and absolutely smashing it. <laughs> it's the worst. Isn't it the most disconcerting thing? It's, oh, it's just... horrible. It's horrible. I, I don't know. I don't know why. I, I, I've asked myself, you know, is it luck? Or, and it's, you know, everybody says it's only right that you get. I thought, well, I think I, I don't believe you, but I see it more as grace than luck. You know. Did you did you have any inkling at all about the the cultural significance of the show and and how just how massive it would be and how relevant it would continue being? No, I mean. It, it, <laughs> hindsight um no you don't the, the the cultural significance to um how african americans view themselves and how the world the, the non-white world viewed itself was um through the fresh prince of bel-air because it showed that there were decision makers i mean it, it, as we know it's it's got nothing to do with real life but that you know but it is a reflection of you know how 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 a, a, a race of people are perceived. Um, the the characters who led the show were moving away from being employees to people who were decision makers, and so it finally the kind of apex of all that was Philip Banks being the partner in a very very successful and expensive law firm in. Beverly Hills, yeah. you know, rather than, you know, a, a, a liquor shop in Compton, as it, it were. The marvelous thing about the show is that it, it never sucker punched you. It never bashed you on the head with yeah. a message. I heard it described as the Trojan horse of television. Well, that, that's, yes, that, 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 that's even much clearer than I could put it. You, you presume it is one thing and it isn't that at all. It, you, if you take it on face value, you've had it, yeah. It dealt with everything. It, um, events, you know, um, uh, you know, white, black people being arrested by the police about status. Um, you know, you presume that because you're rich you know, and the whole thing and the status of Jeffrey, um, you know, the, the, the fact that he loved his work, that he, you know, he loved, you know, he never complained about his job. He, you know, he was always, he took pride in what he did, you know, and, and, and it, was, it was all those things put together that you had a, a group of, 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 of seven people plus one, uh, Jazzy Jeff, who actually... Um, <laughs> reveled in, in, in what they did and, and who they were, yes. I think we were the last big network production because, the, the, you know, the, 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 the cable companies started moving in, you know, uh, as the platforms have now, you know. We were, and we were the last real uh, a hit show controlled by one network that, you know, Everybody wanted to see. He went to see NBC to see the Fresh Prince of Bel Air at eight o'clock on a Monday night. You gave up football for the twenty-eight minutes to watch the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. I mean, it was extraordinary. And so, so watching the reunion show, it struck me how much of a huge loss <laughs> and trauma that would have been when that actually ended. Because you signed up for the six years up front. So having that security and then it coming to an end must have been a huge change. Like how did you cope with that? <laughs> <laughs> well it it was it <laughs> <laughs> 
No, no, I couldn't. You saw the reunion. My God. The thing about is when I think it was 1994 when Will got uh, when when they decided to put Will in, uh, in in six degrees of separation. Will said to us, he said, well. As you know, you know, it is coming to an end. We're going to finish in March 1996. So we had about two years to prepare for it. Once you've gone over the fact that, you know, the, the weekly paycheck is, is, is not coming, you kind of then you begin to realize that, the, that you have these generations that grew up with the show. I mean, what, we are 30 years old and we are still... The, <laughs> the highest rating show in syndication. And we have been the top show in syndication for 30 years. Do you find that the younger generations now are, are ask, like talking to you in the streets and stuff, are you being, do you find that the age has dropped of people that recognize you? Well, yes. I mean, uh, especially during lockdown, it's been, it's been really, because there are, there are children across the road and, you know, usually it's like um, they, they kind of, they, they, they pretend that they, you know, they, they, that they don't know you. Now they just shout across the road. You know, when, 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 when we go out on a Thursday to, to, to you know, to, to, to acknowledge the NHS, you know, they, they go, oh, it's Jeffrey, how you doing, Mr. Marcel, you all right? Yeah. I'm really interested in how you how you cope with with that huge change of the weekly paycheck and of the security and of that family unit in America. Are you scared about finding work again after that? Yeah, yeah no matter who you are, you, you, you know, you're, you, you, you have to return to the marketplace and you're always scared returning to the marketplace, whether you whether you make 20 million a movie or or you make 40 pounds a week, you know, you, you are always scared. and. You know, it's the, the, the problem, the hardest part of it for me was not wanting to repeat myself. Yeah, I could, I could continue doing Jeffrey till I'm 99. Yeah, you know, I could do, um, you know, reality shows, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No, no, Jeffrey finished in 1996. That's it. It's done. So I move on to the next job. So my fear was not that I would not get another job, but every other job would want me to do the thing that I was most successful. I attempt to be as versatile as I can be, and they still allow me the opportunity to do that. Yeah, it's, it's well, you've had the most incredible career. And, and I assume if you'd have carried on as an electrical engineer, you'd have probably retired a, a wee while ago. <laughs> 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 or probably electrocuted myself. <laughs> <laughs> One or the other. This industry, as we've discussed, is full of uncertainty. And I feel like especially now it's very uncertain. What do you wish someone had said to the young Joseph Marcel just starting out? What do you wish you'd heard at the beginning? Oh, heavens. There were... There was a director called uh, Jonathan Lamed, who was also a, an arts council official. And, and, you know, one of the things he said to me was that, you know, it's, it's, it's about preparation. It's about dedication. You know. um, uh, other, other people said to me, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's hard. It's going to be really difficult. You know, you, you're going to wish you're going to be doing something else. But for myself, what... Well, I wish, I, and it's taken me a long time to, to, to realize it, that it is up to me to take responsibility for my career and what I do. And I wish somebody had told me that a long time ago, but I've, I've yeah, it is up to you. It, you. You are the one who has to stay up and learn the shit. And, you know, and remember, it is you, it is you. You have to take responsibility. And I wish somebody had told me that. Joseph Marcel, thank you so much for your time. It's been so lovely talking to you. Victoria Blunt, it's my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> that was my green room chat with the brilliant Joseph Marcel. I genuinely had no idea that self-tapes were a thing in the 90s. <laughs> And for that, I apologise. Anyway, tune in next time when I'm going to be doing something slightly differently. Um, 
I had a request to speak to someone on the other side of the table and that's exactly what I'm going to do. She's a casting director and a producer and she's best known for her work at Shakespeare's Globe Theatre in London. She has some really interesting insights on the audition process from her side of the table so don't miss it. In the meantime, do subscribe and share us with a friend. This podcast was recorded, edited and produced by me, Victoria Blunt, with music from the musical legend Joey Hickman. Thanks to Eva Filer, Emma Fawcett, Alistair MacDonald and Alan Stanley Harrison.